Thank you so much, Taylor. And thank you, colleagues. We're delighted uh, to welcome you all here in this Zoom space. Uh, my name is Ian Kissel. I, I teach at Cornell Law School in our clinical program and co-chair with Alice Farmer of UNHCR, the interest group on international refugee law. We are delighted to be collaborating with to close friend colleagues um, and collaborators in the Migration Law Interest Group, Melissa Stewart and Shana Tabak, who's uh, not here today, in a conversation series that we really hope is uh, our sort of envision as an informal space to have um, tough, interesting, provocative conversations about international refugee and migration law um, in a space that's you know less structured, less hierarchical. Um, you know, less, uh, has fewer barriers to participation and um, with, with some great and engaging speakers. So this is the second installment of this conversation series, which we uh, started this fall. And um, it's really wonderful to have you all here because we want this to, I mean, we recognize that we're sort of constrained by Zoom. People are, you know, have Zoom fatigue and yet also use Zoom as an opportunity to participate in conversations that they might otherwise not have been able, uh, able to be a part of. Um, you know, we can't give you tea and biscuits, uh, though we would certainly would like to, uh, but what we can do is ask you to keep your cameras on, um, you know, participate in this as you would in an informal space. Um, this is really intended to be your space to, to benefit from this conversation. Um, so feel free to, if, if that's convenient for you to keep, keep your video on through the presentation. Um, I'll, although Susan will be sharing her, our speaker will be sharing her screen, um, and also to use the raise hand function as well as the chat for questions. Um, as the, the I'll, I'll introduce our speaker in a moment, but as uh, the presentation and discussion proceeds, feel free to raise your hand and put uh, questions in the chat to, to all or to Alice Farmer, my, my co-chair who will be moderating the Q&A. Um, uh, but I'm hopeful that we can ask you to raise your question directly so it's not sort of a, um, so that so that we encourage participation. So do plan to engage in the Q and A. So with that um, unnecessarily long introduction, um, I will now uh, have an abbreviated discussion of our speaker. Um, you can all find her her bio uh, and publications on uh, her profile website at, at uh, Boston University. Our, uh, our we are pleased to have joining us today for as our second conversation series series speaker, a former chair of the interest group. Um, and, a, and a friend and colleague, Professor Susan Akram, who's a clinical professor at Boston University School of Law. Um, Susan's work is most likely known to many of you as well as her, her engagement in the field. Um, but, uh, but it's a particularly distinct pleasure for me to introduce Susan, who I consider to be one of the, the people responsible for my having the, the confidence to enter this field of refugee rights and, and human rights law. Um, it, it, Susan's really a wonderful example of an engaged scholar uh, and a practitioner. Um, and I imagine that there may be some of her former students who she's uh, sent off into this field joining us today. So um, thank you, Susan, for joining us. And uh, without any further ado, please take it away um, and share your screen. And we look forward to learning from you and discussing these issues with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian. And uh, it's great to see a lot of uh, colleagues and friends here. Uh, all engaged and interested in uh, forced migration. Uh, so I'm going to try to keep to 30 minutes uh, and Ian's going to give me a hard stop at five minutes so I don't go over. Uh, so bear with me while I share some quite dense slides, but I'll try to simplify the conversation uh, and cover a lot of ground in this time, I hope. Um, so since the Syrian refugee crisis is the largest, most recent refugee situation aside from the Ukrainian, I want to illustrate the international response to the Syrian as the most relevant contrast with the response to Ukrainian refugees. So after a short mapping of the legal statuses that have been offered to Syrian refugees since the start of the crisis in 2011 in the main host states, I'll discuss the more recent barriers to Syrian refugee admissions and the latest host country policies towards Syrian refugees, including the most recent efforts to return them, quote unquote, voluntarily or deport them to Syria. 
Finally, I want to summarize the legal statuses offered to Ukrainian refugees in the main host, as well as other states, contrast how some of these states have responded during the last 10 years to Syrian refugees and ask what lessons can be learned during the last, uh, what lessons can be learned from the Ukrainian situation to the search for durable so solutions for displaced Syrians. Uh, as you all know, 11 years since the start of the Syrian refugee exodus, Syrian displacement remains the world's largest current uh, refugee crisis. After hosting millions of refugees for over 10 years with varying forms of legal status and a range of benefits and social support, increasingly from 2015 onwards, the main host states have begun to close their borders, placing greater and greater barriers to prevent Syrians from entering and remaining and making their lives more difficult in their territories. This year, Lebanon and Turkey have begun forcibly returning or deporting Syrians back to Syria. And Turkey has, um, and Syria and, and Lebanon have also been putting coercive measures in place to encourage them to return. At least one Euro European country, Denmark, has withdrawn legal status from Syrian refugees and is, in, is forcing them to choose between detention and return. Uh, so you can see on the slide, uh, Syria, up to 7 million refugees, uh, largest displaced population, accounting for nearly one third of the total global refugee population, followed by Afghanistan, uh, Ukraine, South Sudan, and Venezuela, the top five source countries. Combined refugees from the 10 most common countries of origin account for 82% or approximately 16.3 million of the world's refugees. You all know this displacement distribution, I'm not going to say much about it, but the graph shows the comparative allocation by mid 2022. While Turkey has hosted the largest number of Syrian refugees, more than 3.6 million, Lebanon has hosted the next highest number, about 831,000, which represents about 14% of the Lebanese population. Uh, in addition to Syrians, official figures are that one in six people in Lebanon is a refugee today, while unofficial estimates are that one in four people in Lebanon is a refugee. The slide shows the numbers for all forcibly displaced categories, not just refugees. Germany, Russia, and Poland are the only highly developed countries here due to the Ukrainian refugee solution situation, not other refugee and displacement situations. So I'm going to kind of skip the, this slide other than to say that it illustrates the contrasting share of the global refugee population taken by the least developed countries as opposed to the most developed countries. Uh, now, let me give you a snapshot of the laws and policies that main host states put in place for Syrian as well as other refugees prior to the Ukrainian conflict. Lebanon and Jordan, as non-parties to the Refugee Convention or Protocol, have no national refugee legislation, so Syrians have not been recognized as refugees in the country. Both countries do, however, have agreements that authorize UNHCR to conduct refugee status determination and recognize Syrians as asylum seekers, but pending resettlement to other countries. In other words, Lebanon. Oh. Um, both Lebanon and Jordan put in place temporary residence permits for Syrians while UNHCR conducted refugee status determinations and promoted resettlement but for only the most vulnerable. The vast majority of Syrians in Jordan were con confined to two major camps with restrictions on work, while in Lebanon, the government prohibited camp construction, that prohibition continues today, and the majority of Syrians have struggled with temporary and precarious housing and limited authorization to work. In Lebanon, the major protection problems have persisted, informal camp settlements subject to constant de uh, destruction, mostly on private land in rural areas and outside cities, the lack of registration of refugees in the cities and difficulties with service provision, lack of status, 
lack of ability to get work permits, and arbitrary detention, and more recently that I'll talk about more later, reported forced returns. Lebanon has, as I mentioned, uh, resisted camp construction for Syrian refugees, although about 10% of the Syrian population lives in tented settlements that are not recognized by the government. Non-Palestinian Syrians must apply to the Ministry of Labor for work permits, but if they obtain work permits, they have to withdraw their refugee claims with UNHCR. And of course, there are ongoing problems with detention. Even before the Syrian crisis, Lebanon was thought to be detaining hundreds of asylum seekers and refugees, including refugees registered with UNHCR. And authorities continue to arrest refugees for illegal entry. As I mentioned, Jordan has no refugee framework. So Syrian and other refugees are registered with uh, UNHCR as asylum seekers to countries other than Jordan with a renewable time limit on that status. Syrians have been subject to a special automatic renewal, but they have to remain in the camps where they are registered. The main protection and status problems in Jordan are the conditions in the camps, the reluctance of many refugees to register, the inability to work, and the si uh, situation of Palestinians from Syria. Palestinians from Syria are not entitled to any status, and the Jordanian government has put an unofficial policy in place of not one more Palestinian in Jordan since 2014. There's been ongoing detention and removal of Palestinians to Syria, and neither UNRWA nor any of the uh, non-governmental organizations has been successful at intervening in detention and deportation. Uh, at the same time, Syria has put an unofficial policy in place that any Palestinian who has left the country will not be able to return. Turkey, in contrast, while a state party to the Refugee Convention maintains the geographic restriction in the convention by which it only recognizes European refugees. At the start of the Syrian conflict, Turkey put a temporary protection policy in place for Syrians, which was formalized in its 2013 law on foreigners and international protection, the LFIP. Turkey's temporary protection regulation grants Syrian refugees basic services, health, care, education, travel to and between provinces, but requires them to remain in the province where they are registered. Turkey's been extremely generous to Syrian refugees and the majority have been able to receive education, social services, and other benefits in the province where they're registered. Turkey constructed state-of-the-art uh, modular housing units on the border, primarily in Gaziantep and other border provinces and allowed limited numbers to work. But between late 2017 and early 2018, uh, Istanbul and nine border provinces with Syria suspended registration of newly arrived asylum seekers. Turkey's deputy interior minister has said in, uh, since February of 2022 that applications for temporary and international protection would not be accepted in 16 provinces and that residence permit applications would not be accepted in any neighborhood in which 25% or more of the population consisted of, quote unquote, foreigners. Um, in June, the interior minister announced that from July 1st onwards, the proportion would be reduced to 20% and the number of neighborhoods closed to foreigners registrations increased to 1,200. Temporary protected status of Syrians was canceled for Syrians who traveled within the country without permission, and Syrians interviewed said they were arrested on the streets and during raids on their homes or workplaces. More on this in a, in a moment. Let me final, finally uh, touch on Egypt. Egypt is an extremely interesting uh, North African country in that it's a party to both the 51 Refugee Convention and the Organization of African Unity 1969 Convention on Refugees with its much broader definition. But Egypt has not codified any refugee or asylum legislation based on these treaty obligations, so it leaves refugee determination to UNHCR. UNHCR in turn applies both treaty standards, uh, so refugees who don't meet the 
51 convention definition are likely to meet the broader criteria of OAU 69. Unfortunately, Western states don't accept refugees for resettlement who meet the uh, OAU 69 criteria, only those meeting the uh, 51 refugee convention criteria. So the vast majority of refugees in Egypt whom UNHCR processes are ineligible for resettlement to other countries that only recognize the refugee convention. Because of the huge number of refugees, migrants, and displaced people in Egypt, Sudanese, Somalis, Libyans, and other North Africans, as well as the Syrians, UNHCR has a huge backlog of cases. The government and UNHCR have set up a very complicated process of different registration statuses uh, designated by various colored registration and permit cards. Only the blue cards that are issued after full refugee status determination entitle the holder to a residence permit in Egypt and very few refugees are able to get the blue cards. Uh, the Syrian-Egypt relationship prior to 2013 was governed by the United Arab Republic Agreement that placed no visa requirements on travel between them. But from July 2013 onwards, Syrians have to obtain visas and obtain security clearances from Syria before they can enter Egypt. So these are pretty much impossible to obtain. Um, just to mention about Palestinian refugees in Egypt that comprise one of the largest uh, refugee populations in the country. Unfortunately, Egypt is not an UNRWA field, so UNRWA does not operate to register Palestinian refugees there. Uh, Egypt excludes Palestinians from protection or assistance from UNHCR and does not recognize them as refugees under OAU or the 51 Convention. Um, so you can see the protection gaps are massive in Egypt. Housing is a huge problem. Egypt is not setting up camps. All housing is privatized. And the uh, ministries have struggled with arrangements for some form of uh, subsidized housing. Uh, if there's no right to work, the individual absolutely has no resources to meet the survival needs through humanitarian aid. Um, and there are other problems that uh, relate to lack of residence permits or vi valid visas that affect the right of kids, for example, to go to school. So the current situation for Syrians in the main host states, there are two major reports from Human Rights Watch and Amnesty uh, that are now documenting coerced removals and deportations from Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, uh, and actually Iraq, which I'm not going to cover uh, here. In 2018, Lebanon began organizing what it calls voluntary return trips. Syrians would be registered, and then the list would be run by Syrian security officials to see if anyone on it was wanted for arrest or considered a security threat. Then these names would be taken off the list, supposedly, uh, and the uh, social affairs minister said the returnees, I quote, have received guarantees from the Lebanese and Syrian authorities to return. On October 12, the Lebanese president said that uh, Lebanon would start sending Syrian refugees back home. The uh, returns were stopped in 2020 due to uh, the coronavirus pandemic. But after 21,000 refugees had already been returned to Syria. On 13 October, uh, the uh, General Security Authority head announced that uh, this was last year, last October, that uh, Syrian refugees now uh, returns would be restarted, and 1,600 Syrian refugees were on the list for clearance for return. In Turkey, uh, in May of 2022, the president announced he intended to settle 1 million Syrian refugees in northern Syria in areas not controlled by the Syrian government. Turkish authorities have begun arresting, detaining, and deporting thousands of Syrians since 2022, since February of 2022, and records show that 11, 000, over 11,000 people were returned from Turkey at uh, Babel Hawa, the main crossing, 
and over 8,000 through Baba Salam, the second crossing based on the data that local authorities at the borders are keeping. In Jordan from mid 2013 onwards, uh, there has been restriction of entry to Syrians. The informal borders have been closed and the last border crossing at Rukban was finally closed last year. And Jordan has, as I mentioned, put new policies in place to bar Syrian refugees from maintaining legal status uh, or from returning from Syria if they go back even for a short time. Egypt finally is not removing Syrian Syrians, but with increasing restrictions on their status, more and more are trying to leave for other countries. Despite the problems refugees from Syria are facing in Egypt, the problems, their problems are dwarfed by those of the Palestinian refugees from Syria. For them, the situation has become desperate. Many are being arrested and detained for illegal presence. There have been well over a thousand Palestinians from Syria detained. And since the government makes their release conditioned on obtaining airline tickets out of Egypt, they can't get out of detention because, of course, they have no documents uh, to be able to travel. So Palestinians have been trying to leave Egypt illegally by boats, heading to Italy or getting out of Egypt any way they can. And they are the prime victims for traffickers. Most of the incidents with boats capsizing off of Egypt have involved Palestinians from Syria as they are the majority of the refugees who are trying to leave in this way. So uh, according to the reports uh, that I've reviewed on coerced removals and deportations from Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey, uh, the Lebanese authorities are scaling up the so-called voluntary returns, a plan which has been in place for four years when it's well established that Syrian refugees in Lebanon are not in a position to take a free and informed decision about their return due to the government policies on movement and residency, rampant discrimination, lack of access to essential services, as well as unavailability of objective and updated information about the current human rights situation in Syria. De uh, as far as Turkey, deported Syrians have told Human Rights Watch that Turkish officials arrested them in their homes, workplaces, and on the streets, detained them, beat and abused most of them, forced them to sign voluntary return forms, drove them to crossing points in, uh, with northern Syria, and forced them across at gunpoint. Human Rights Watch has interviewed Syrian men and boys who've been registered for temporary protection but were then deported. They, were said, uh, they said they were forced to sign forms at removal centers of the border with Syria. And officials, of course, did not explain what the forms were, did not allow, allow them to read them, but they all understood they were being forced to agree to being returned. Uh, sorry. Uh, just last Jordan, despite the Jordan Compact, which was intended to improve the livelihoods of Syrian refugees by giving them work opportunities, most professions remained closed to non-Jordanians and the majority of Syrians have had to work in the informal sector, sector without labor protections. Many Syrians lost their jobs or faced reduced salaries during the pandemic, which severely affected refugee households. According to UNHCR, only 2% of refugee households can meet their essential food needs without negative coping strategies, which include cutting down on meals, pulling children out of school, early marriage, and sending family members to beg. So in its seventh regional uh, survey on Syrian refugees perception, UNHCR um, produce data on uh, the refugees' intentions to return to, uh, to Syria. This was conducted among Syrian refugees in Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, and Libya. And the findings show the extremely difficult conditions for the vast majority of refugees in all four countries, forcing many to decide whether they can survive if they remain. About 90% of the Syrian refugees indicated they don't have a source of income that covers the basic needs of their families. And this was highest in Egypt at 92% and 90% in both Jordan and Lebanon. Uh, 
UNHCR has also conducted a survey each year on intentions to return, and the most recent survey found very few Syrian refugees intend to return in the next 12 months. And they uh, indicated a range of safety and security issues, ongoing conflict, lack of safety, security and law uh, and order, armed actors on all sides, and threat of military conscription. At the same time, the majority of Syrian refugees hope to return to Syria one day, but overall about 30% of Syrian refugees say they have no hope of returning to Syria ever. Now, what's the actual situation? I'll only touch on this because there have been quite amazing reports, uh, especially from the United Nations uh, Commission of Inquiry on Syria that has been doing regular reports on conditions in the country. But all of the detailed and credible re reports indicate that nowhere in Syria is safe. UNHCR says that Syria is unsafe and that it will not facilitate returns without assurance that key protection conditions have been met. In its report, Our Lives Are Like Death, Human Rights Watch documents the reasons that Syria is not safe based on refugee uh, interviews. Um, from returnees, of returnees from Jordan and Lebanon. And the, re the report documents that returnees face many of the same violations today that caused them to leave in the first place. Persecution, arbitrary arrests, unlawful detention, torture, extrajudicial -jud killings, kidnappings, widespread bribery and extortion, all at the hands of Syrian security agencies and government affiliated militias. Uh, the Syrian Human Rights Network has estimated that nearly 150,000 people have been arbitrary, arbitrarily arrested and detained, and nearly 15,000 have died from torture, and that's between 2011 and 2021. Um, so we have similar findings from the UN Commission of Inquiry um, and uh, several other reports, including Human Rights Watch, as I mentioned. So now we come to durable solutions. What are durable solutions for Syrians? Number one, of course, as you all know, is voluntary repatriation. We've already uh, discussed how um, voluntary repatriation is close to impossible uh, for Syrians. But to look at the global trend of voluntary rep repatriation, you see here that the Syrian a uh, protracted situation is very similar as the trend for other refugees. And voluntary rep repatriation has uh, steadily and then suddenly dropped uh, from 2002 onwards. Uh, so over the past 10 years, just over 1 million refugees were resettled compared to 3.9 million who were returned. Uh, but in the first half of 2021, uh, only 126,000 refugees have returned to 23 countries of origin. So displaced Syrians joined the protracted refugee situations for which return is not viable in the foreseeable future. What's, Susan, what this is your five minute warning. Okay. So what about resettlement? The needs gap is growing. I won't say more about this. You can see this and you know this. Uh, how about durable solutions? Um, in Europe, here we have, uh, the picture is mostly externalizing refugee responsibility uh, and, and increasing uh, restrictive agreements. There are now 18 agreements between EU states and other states to contain the refugee uh, situation, uh, increasing since the Syrian refugee crisis. Uh, this is mirrored in the Americas with safe third country agreements. Uh, you all know the situation. And uh, the Trump policies, uh, here are two slides on the Trump policies. I won't talk more about them. But the vast majority of these barriers and exclusionary policies have not been reversed by the Biden administration. So now I want to talk about uh, the Ukrainian situation and the response there. 
Within the first month of the start of the war in Ukraine, the EU triggered implementation of the Temporary Protection Directive. Uh, and this was for the first time, even though the Temporary Protection Directive has been in place since 2001. The slide shows the response from EU states to where Ukrainians have fled uh, in response to the directive. Among the EU member states for which data are available, Poland granted the highest number of temporary protection statuses to Ukrainians. Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, um, and as you know, temporary protection has been a norm of temporary refuge in various uh, configurations since the 1990s. Uh, I won't go through those. You are very familiar with temporary protection in the United States. So uh, the US, as you know, triggered temporary protected status for Ukrainians uh, very early on. And uh, elements, yes, I just want to say, note the differences between the cr criteria for temporary protection under the EU directive and the forms of temporary protection offered by the Syrian refugee host states. Employment, Housing, social welfare, medical care, freedom of movement, access to asylum process, and criteria that must be met before temporary protection can be terminated are part of the EU directive. In none of the main host states for Syrians is access to a domestic asylum process available, much less any of these guarantees. In the EU, no one is discussing placing Ukrainians in refugee camps. Poland, though setting up temporary accommodation centers, moved quickly to facilitate better conditions for Ukrainian refugees, allowing them to open bank accounts, authorization to work, etc. And another important contrast between these two situations is Denmark's policies. Shortly after the invasion of Ukraine, the Danish Immigration Service asked Denmark's 98 municipalities to assess their capacity to take in Ukrainian refugees. This same agency uh, has begun stripping Syrian refugees of their residency permits, asserting that parts of Syria are safe. In the last few years, Denmark has been at the forefront among European countries to enact restrictive laws and policies designed to deter people from seeking asylum. And I'll just mention one uh, under its zero asylum policy, and that is the so-called jewelry law, a measure that allows the government to seek uh, to seize asylum seekers' assets, including their jewelry, to fund their stay in the country. The Danish government has clarified that Ukrainian refugees are exempted from this law. Uh, so other than the temporary protection directive, other EU directives also compel member states to enact legislation members for extending protection to persons who don't readily fall under the convention refugee definition. Won't say more about that. You also know that some countries that admitted Syrians did so under complementary pathways. Here are just a few of them, Canada, Australia, Germany, and Sweden. These have now pretty much been terminated for Syrians. And a final point of comparison is the funding picture. Uh, I won't say more about this, but you can see the Ukrainian funding update, 89% for the um, uh, requests from the UN, UNHCR, while the Syrian funding update request is a contrast of 34%. So the first and most obvious conclusion to be drawn from this excursus and comparative review of Syrian versus Ukrainian displacement is that Syria is not safe for the vast majority of Syrians who fled the crisis to return. At the same time, the welcome mat has been pulled from Syrians in the main host states of Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, and Turkey, and some European states led by Denmark. More Syrians will face coercive measures to force return or deportation to Syria. No more than states have recognized that they cannot deport or coerce Ukrainians to return. They must recognize they cannot refuel Syrians either. But this means that the responsibility sharing measures that Europe and other countries in the global North have rolled out for Ukrainians must be made available at the same level for Syrians. The most concrete and immediate steps that all EU states can take 
is to apply the 2001 Temporary Protection Directive it so swiftly put in place for Ukrainians to all displaced Syrians, including those in the MENA host states. As we recommended in our uh, clinic Syrian refugee report back in 2014, the Temporary Protection Directive criteria apply to the Syrian crisis and should be implemented directly through EU country consulates in the host countries, rather than wait until more Syrians flee the increasingly hostile countries in which they've been residing by taking precarious land and sea journeys, European countries should be processing them through a managed in-country consulate procedure, prioritizing family unity. Those with a range of temporary statuses who have been residing in European and other countries outside the MENA region for five years or more should have pathways to permanent residence, just as people with family-based and employment visas in most countries in the global north have such a pathway. Finally, there has to be a serious reconsideration about how funding is allocated among conflict-induced emergencies. A UNHCR level three emergency designation must receive parallel funding for the same number of persons displaced in each one. Most critical is that funding to entrench the containment paradigm that forces the majority of refugees into states least able to provide for them with livelihoods and dignified existence must be replaced with funding that accompanies a far more robust responsibility sharing of the refugees themselves. We all know what this would mean. Well-managed, equitably distributed program of much greater resettlement opportunities, contextually appropriate complementary pathways, and far greater allocation of employment-based, family-based, and humanitarian-based visas in the global north. I ran a little over. I'm so sorry, but there was a lot to cover. Um, thank you so much, Susan. Uh, this has been such an interesting presentation and comparing these two um, global refugee crises that have been very much at the forefront of people's minds, I think is a really powerful comparison. Um, we've got a lot of um, questions coming in on the chat and I'm gonna ask people to turn on their cameras and ask them themselves. Um, but while we get ready for that, I can kick off with the first question um, and say, when, I was interested in your slide on um, comparing different funding levels for different operations. Um, in my own career, I've worked in different operations with vastly different amounts of funding available. And it, it's absolutely right there. There can be pretty huge discrepancies there. Um, I was wondering if, first, do you think it's a valid argument? I wonder if you could comment on the argument that Global North governments make that because they are funding refugee operations, that is their part of the responsibility sharing. And therefore the, the weight of actually hosting refugees doesn't fall to them as much. I would be interested in your thoughts on that. And then in parallel, I was wondering if when you were looking at the funding numbers, if you'd ever looked at the Africa operations, which tend to be, many of them tend to be incredibly underfunded even compared to that Syrian 34% number, um, yeah. Uh, yes, so so of course, uh, I have heard the argument about funding as a substitute for accepting refugees from both the refugee host countries and the countries that are sending funds. And one of the most interesting conversations I had with was with members of the uh, Turkish ministry. Um, and they said that uh, they had spent more than the entire EU as a single country on the Syrian refugee crisis, as well as hosting the refugees. So uh, hosting countries don't buy that there's an equivalence and they see the funding as basically a bribe to prevent uh, refugees from moving on uh, to European states. Um, so one of the interesting takeaways from one of the slides about the proportion of refugees per native population is that much of the global north has uh, a population deficit uh, and actually need refugees and immigrants uh, desperately. I know here in the United States, for example, 
uh, certainly in Massachusetts, uh, there are um, two jobs for every uh, employment seeker at the moment. Uh, Social Security and other major benefits are going to be lost for countries in the global north if they don't have young workers to sustain them. So there is both an economic and self-centered argument why the global north should accept more refugees and why it's actually in their best interest. Um, so I'm extremely skeptical about money as a substitute for actual responsibility sharing. On the one hand, as sort of an economic, a moral, and a practical argument, but on the other hand, there is the serious obligation under the Refugee Convention, one of the reasons that I so emphasize that Jordan and Lebanon are not parties to the Refugee Convention is that here are states who do not have the treaty-based obligation to host refugees over time and provide them with the benefits guaranteed in the convention. Are the ones bearing uh, uh, over 50% of the global refugee population, while states that are parties and were the promoters, remain the promoters of the Refugee Convention and Protocol, are resisting the obligations under those treaties. And on the second question about Africa, I've not taken, uh, uh, really my, my work has been in the Middle East uh, region, and so that's where my, my knowledge is. I'm woefully uh, inadequate to respond uh, much about Africa other than having done a fair amount of research on African refugees that are in the MENA region. And Egypt, for example, has had, prior to the Syrian crisis, a massive refugee population from Somalia uh, and both Sudans. Uh, and various, various uh, domestic crises and crises with UNHCR and the government related to those populations. So they are very much, uh, in fact, one of the well-known refugee organizations in Cairo, when we were doing our mapping work on the Syrian crisis, uh, said something that has stuck in my mind ever since. Well, the Syrians are the flavor of the month and the international community is gonna move on and forget them just like they have the Somalis and the Sudanese. Well, I think that's a, um, that's a powerful statement to reflect the state of where we are. Um, and I think this might be a nice moment to bring in Luis Felipe, Luis Felipe, um, who's raising a question about um, Brazil, which is a nice contrast. Go ahead, Luis. So congratulations, Professor. I like much the lecture. Know how the Brazilian government operates with the Venezuelan refugees and other refugees here in Brazil, and we have uh, what we call of migration governance that is integrate the public, the private, and the ONGs organizations, uh, NGOs, sorry. <laughs> organizations to assist all the refugees and make they very welcome here in Brazil, assisting them to get documents, get employment, and get a place to stay on major count, major states as Sao Paulo and Pernambuco, and also Roraima is the front door where they most of the Venezuelan arrive here in Brazil. And I don't know if you know something about this procedure we are taking here and what is called a welcome operation. Yes, shall I just comment? Um, so uh, I'm a big fan of Brazil and Brazil's refugee policies and Brazil was one of uh, half a dozen countries that actually solved the crisis of Iraqi refugees on the Jordanian and Lebanese uh, 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 borders, sorry, Jordanian and Syrian borders from the camps there, the no man's land. Um, and it was because of Latin America that UNHCR was able to move those refugees out of that horrendous situation. Uh, also, Brazil is one of the countries under the Mexico Plan of Action that is instituting new pathways uh, 
uh, and is specifically focusing on refugees from the Middle East. And I think Brazil has recently uh, initiated a stateless status determination and granted a long time uh, stateless person from Lebanon. I think she was the first to get stateless status recognition in Brazil, if I'm not mistaken. So um, I think UNHCR is viewing Latin America, uh, Brazil, Chile, um, Argentina, uh, I think are the three main countries. They're being viewed as the sort of new horizons for resettlement. So love the wonderful work. We love you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Colombia, Colombia, they have a, a huge operation to assist the refugees also. They have comparing, they have 1 million Venezuelans and Brazil have 100,000, almost 10% of them. Amazing, amazing, thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so perhaps another way of discussing the responsibility sharing questions I could pass over to Kate Jastrom. Um, go ahead, Kate. Hi, Kate. So thank you for your presentation, for all of your work. I confess I am so head down with the US asylum issues now that it was really wonderful to hear this update, albeit very depressing, about Syria. So I had posted my note about responsibility sharing before you addressed it. So I wonder if I can shift my question a little bit. I guess what I want to know is whether any governments are criticizing governments like Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan who are conducting these forced returns. I mean, certainly the U.S. has you know, no, no high ground on which to stand to criticize other countries' um, treatment of refugees at this point in time, but I'm, I'm just wondering, are they, are these governments kind of suffering any kind of reputational damage or criticism for this really egregious behavior? Thank you. That's a really important question. Thank you, Kate. I just, in, uh, in November, went uh, to a kind of closed workshop in uh, Abu Dhabi with representatives of the various UN organizations and major INGOs uh, that are working on the Syrian uh, refugee situation. And I presented the findings about the returns and most of the responses were from the international agencies that this wasn't happening, even though the data is there. So there is no pushback from, as far as I can tell, at least public facing pushback from even the UN agencies that are working there, much less the governments from outside. Uh, when I read these reports carefully and went back over them um, and contacted some of the researchers, I was frankly shocked that I knew so little about this because I'm a pretty close observer of what's happening and that people in the field were reacting to the presentation about this data as if it was not true. So, and partly why I'm interested in talking to all of you and others about what's happening is to generate some kind of response because this has to stop. Um, yeah, well, well said, thank you, Susan. Um, Adrian, you had a question about um, the EU member states' differential responses. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, Mom. The, the, sorry, the invitation to join the Zoom webinar, and um, I'll just get right into it. Uh, for anybody that can answer this question, basically, I would like someone to comment on the diversities and disparities, especially disproportionate asylum policies that we see for particular EU member states that are letting in Ukrainian ref uh, refugees, particularly Poland and um, uh, other Western uh, states that are averse to uh, taking in Syrian refugee states like Hungary, uh, Bulgaria. And uh, is there trends of um, 
deciding based on social welfare, viability, capability, adjust to the workforce, or is it just because of standard ethnic differences that wouldn't be a surprise considering uh, the history that Europe has had with these tendencies? Uh, I'll let others jump in, but uh, I have heard from both sides, from the MENA governments, as well as European uh, actors, um, MENA governments have said that it's been very clear to them that Muslim refugees are not welcome in Europe. And uh, I mean, those statements have been made clearly by politicians in, the, in European states. Uh, I think racism has something to do with it. I think anti-Muslim uh, bigotry has something to do with it. Uh, and I am also very skeptical of this European response that, well, the Ukrainians are our European neighbors, therefore we have a responsibility towards them uh, as the MENA states are neighbors to Syria and therefore they should manage the Syrian conflict. Uh, I, I already mentioned my response to that but it would be great to hear from others on this. Um, I can chime in while other people are thinking and just say that from the time that I spent working in Moldova at the beginning of the emergency, the political situation was so tense um, and it felt, this was at the beginning of the Ukraine war for the first few months of that war. And so a lot of the money that was flowing into the Ukraine emergency at that point um, was coming from countries that felt like, that were NATO members and felt like they could not do a great deal to directly arm Ukraine, but they could throw a lot of money into the refugee pool. And so the Moldova emergency was very well funded. Um, that is sort of an alternate reading in comparison to the Syrian ones. And my own agency, UNHCR, was certainly pushing to try and get the funding to be as open, as unearmarked as possible. And we saw from Professor Akram's slides that that was not particularly successful. Um, so I'm just throwing that out there. I, as a potential alternate reading, um, that a lot of the motivations of states that gave money had to do with comparing to the, mil the lack of ability to take military action as opposed to comparing to this to other non-white crises. But I, I think there's plausibly room for both readings. I, I don't know if anyone else wants to jump on in and offer their thoughts. All right, then I think the next question is over to you, Lisa. Do you want to introduce yourself and, and, and go ahead? Yeah, uh, thank you, Alice. Uh, I'm Lisa. Uh, uh, currently, I'm based in Ireland, Galway, doing my uh, international law in migration and refugee law. So that's uh, from Irish Center for Human Rights. Actually, I'm from India. So I my uh, thank you, first of all, for a very uh, nice presentation uh, on this. And we are currently also studying the whole whole issue of uh, the refugee uh, issues and, and the, with regard to the law. I just wanted, uh, looking at your presentation, is it not when we talk of voluntary return? Um, you have also later on mentioned uh, in your slides that uh, some of the criteria is how do they decide for the voluntary returns is not something that also will lead to forced returning. So that was one question. Uh, and the other which I wanted also to look at when a Ukrainian war and, and, and also one of the participants also, the members also asked about the, how do we compare or look at uh, whether there is racism or, or these kind of uh, things when we look at the Ukrainian war. Um, when we are looking, maybe what I'm also looking at, the situation which in Ukraine war has been led everyone, is, is, it was, and, and the way it was so much uh, kind of people felt, like especially the Europe region felt it's something to do with them and, and especially supporting the war. 
thing. And then, of course, taking the refugees in and, and giving a lot of uh, funding opportunity funding as well. And and also that discrimination. Uh, but when I was looking at your slides, who has hosted even within the European region, it's the Poland has been the highest number. So it's not something that the most powerful or most uh, influence or, or maybe we can say economically rich country is not something that they are uh, willing so much to share the responsibility and letting that responsibility on others, throwing it on others. Even when we look at this, the whole migration crisis, when we are, it's not crisis, but which is being also uh, so much spoken that push and pull back what we are hearing in Greece and other things. So it's, it's something not that shared responsibility, even within the European context also, within the countries of the European. It is how much that responsibility is being shared and pushing that responsibility on the others and, and not taking that something that if I'm able to do and we, we should be doing it. So that kind of um, not shared responsibility within EU, leave alone that shared responsibility with other at the international law, what we are talking of other regions, uh, global south, global north, that, that is of course that exists. So this is my just, uh, I just thought, and if you can also throw some more light on this point and would be good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, so in terms of responsibility sharing within the EU, um, in 2015, uh, the EU um, issued quotas for EU countries and allocated uh, certain uh, numbers that each EU state uh, was obliged to take. Uh, in the Syrian situation, states did not uh, accept the quotas. In the Ukrainian situation, they have and become, been even more generous than the quotas have required. So uh, there has been EU action at that level to establish the required responsibility sharing amongst the states. So I'm not sure, I think that explains because not every state has the same numbers. Uh, and that so that explains why there are discrepancies between how many. At the same time, because of the EU directives, not just the temporary protection directive, but several other directives, EU has established standards for uh, acceptance and integration of refugees that uh, are subject to temporary protection and other forms of uh, humanitarian uh, admission. And so most states are, as far as I know, all states are complying with those standards for the, the Ukrainians. And of course, since those uh, directives were not triggered for the Syrians or any other refugee population, those standards were not applied. I think um, Thanks, Ian. I think as a very final thought um, as we're at one o'clock is to perhaps um, Susan, I'd be wondering I wonder in your on your final thoughts, maybe we have lost the idea of responsibility sharing and it's never going to happen and we should look to a, a, some sort of protective regime that isn't based around that because we're never going to get there. What do you think? Well, I, I would uh, advocate for the opposite. I would advocate for far more discussion around the responsibility sharing premise of the refugee regime. And I think that's what the global compacts were, has been rejuvenated uh, as an impetus from the UN and all of the major states that came together, major states, every state that came together with I think three exceptions that agreed on the global compact. I won't say who those are. <laughs> We're sitting in one of them. <laughs> um, but that all states came together and agreed on a global compact for both refugees and migrants. And this was an effort to uh, reimpose 
an obligation for responsibility sharing. And I think that is the direction that our efforts need to be um, need to be made. It's more important than ever. And highlighting these distinctions, highlighting uh, and racism that underlie distinctions between refugee groups, I think it's our job to call those out and to insist that responsibility sharing is as bedrock an obligation under the refugee regime today as non um, Professor Akram, thank you for that. That's an excellent, um, excellent thought to end on. Um, thank you so much for your time, for the research and everything that went into the presentation. Um, and thank you everyone for attending and joining our conversations. Thank you, thanks for hosting. See you soon. Thank you so much for this opportunity one more time. Thank you. Thank you. Nice Friday, everyone. Happy Friday.